I'm Amy Smith, and you're listening to The Next Page. For this short end-of-year episode, we thought we would get the leaders of the library and archives together to talk about why knowledge matters in our times, whether libraries matter, and what expertise we need and what digitization, technology, and AI can mean for knowledge services. Francesco Pisano, Sigrun Happersman, and Blondine Blucas Luifer join me for a tour de table about where we are now and what we wish for to advance the conversation on multilateralism and serve as an instrument of international understanding. Hello and welcome back to the next page. This is our end of year episode and it's been quite a year on many fronts. And we have with us today the director and two chiefs of the Library and Archives here to talk with us. So perhaps Francesco, Blondine and Sigrun, would you like to introduce yourselves very briefly? Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me for once on this side of the microphone. Uh, I'm Francesco. I'm the director of Library and Archives. Very pleased to be here. Hello. Yes. Yeah, so I'm Sigrun Habermann, and I'm the, the head of the Library Services. And I'm Blondine uh, Lucas Luifer. I'm the head of the Institutional Memory Section. Thank you. Francesco, uh, the Next Fate podcast was your brainchild, and, and this year uh, we reached over 100 episodes of the Next Fate. We passed this milestone, and so for what, what for you have been the highlights in the exchanges we've had on this journey advancing the conversation on multilateralism? Oh, there have been many. I think the original idea with the podcast was to offer to our clients a different way of getting to know things about multilateralism. So if not direct knowledge generation on the part of the library, it was opening a space where knowledge could be generated for them to listen to and to capture in a different way than just reading uh, as you would do in a normal library. I don't think we're the only library in the world that has a, has a podcast. For the highlights, I would, without mentioning names, I think the episode that's really... Um, caught my attention and made me think this is useful and successful in a way, where those that were paying attention to what wants to happen in the space that we call multilateralism. Multilateralism being something that is continuing, developing. I visualize it as an algorithm that is able to feed off anything that happens, good and bad, conflict and peacemaking, you know, negotiation and separation, segregation of views all the same evolving through this contrast all the time. So for me, those episodes were very important. Those where we looked at the emergence rather than things that we believe are true or we want to assert as fundamental truths. So in particular, episodes that had to that dealt with leadership, for example, this recognized lack of value-based moral moral informed leadership in international affairs, those really got through to me. And also um, guests that were really focusing on the multilateralism for the future rather than what could be the future of the current multilateralism mix and formula. Exactly. So I think that's giving us some ideas for next year too. The Library and Archives also has a mission as a center of research and as an instrument of international understanding. What do you think is important for us now in providing access to knowledge for multilateralism and what do you see on the horizon? Well, I think what's important for us, I think, is to understand and apprehend the context. I think in international affairs, context is basically... 90% of it. So we may hold certain things for true and then the context changing and, and makes those things appear in a different light. So I think for knowledge makers and knowledge centers of knowledge and research like us, the context should always be clear, something that we see clearly and we are conscious of. And together with context come technology. For libraries and archives and the preservation business, technology is fundamental, much more than it was before. It's always been in a way, but it's so rapid now 
that losing touch with the technology that informs our business would be would be a very risky behavior for the quality that we try to provide to our clients. Then another thing that is important for us going forward, in my opinion, is to keep the space open. So we hear a lot about uh, including participatory, multi-actor, uh, multilateralism. But things sometimes don't need to be very complex or complicated. Keeping a space where knowledge is generated open and accessible, I think is something that we can do in our daily way of being us, showing up in that space. And the last thing, maybe there are others, but one of the most important is also to be guarantors of fact-checked knowledge in this kind of storm of information, misinformation, disinformation. A library and a center for research should always ask themselves, you know, what is certified knowledge that we can put in the hands of our clients and say, this is certified by us, by you know, a body that has more than 100 years in the business of uh, librarianship and preservation. These are important points, and it sounds like there's going to be a lot of exciting changes coming. So let's hear a little bit more from the library side of things, because we're sitting now in a beautiful room, and behind these walls, somewhere in the back there, we have not far from 36 kilometers of books. And multilateralism, of course, covers wide issues. The collection keeps growing, but obviously we can't cover everything. What is the library going to be focusing on in the coming few years? Thanks for the question, Amy, because obviously it's something that we're always grappling with, right? It's really essential to the work of, of the library. Multilateralism, obviously, we could say, okay, it's the work of the UN on peace security, but then also development, environment, refugees, and so on. What we see, of course, as librarians is that these issues are also interlinked, right? So that is actually one way also of approaching that for a, for a library and a library collection. So what we do in Geneva and what we're going to be doing more of is focusing on the work that the United Nations is doing here in Geneva. So uh, we focus particularly on international law. We have um, a really very interesting and rich international law collection. We are what we consider the professional home, actually, to the International Law Commission. So that gives us really a, a very, very targeted uh, approach to the way we, we create this collection. It's the body of the United Nations that works on the codification of international law, and so we accompany their work. We purchase resources for that collection for them particularly, and this is, I think, where you can see it comes in. This is actually pertaining to the people, to their ambitions, to what they are working on, to the clients, as we say in, in, in library speak there. We're purchasing that, of course, still print, but also mainly in digital resources as well. And so um, what we will focus on is identifying the subjects that they work on. Some of them right now, it's general principles of law, but also other issues like sea level rise. They actually had something on prevention and repression of piracy and armed robbery at sea, the settlement of disputes. So that already gives you the range, but still it, it helps us also limit our choices as well. And then, of course, we also focus on the human rights work that's being done in Geneva. And there we collect a lot of the UN-created knowledge. So that comes out or is documented in the official documents, in the publications, in the reports. So we try to open this information up to the world. And then we are also the library of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So that's an entire field. It's again interlinked with the rest, but we also have some very particular topics. For example, we don't just have generic things like, let's say, statistics about refugees, about migration, statelessness, and so on. But we go into, for example, what are the humanitarian issues for refugees? What are the health care issues that affect them? What are the environmental issues that are connected to refugee situations, and so on? And then, of course, uh, being still on the count up, I guess, to uh, 2030, we used to focus on the SDGs a lot. So SDGs are a very clear focus that's going to remain like this for the, for the upcoming years. And our goal with that, of course, is always to provide all the information necessary for the member states, you know, to achieve the SDGs. So we're in clear support to the member states and the delegates, you know, the people who come here and use the resources for that. You've mentioned a lot about the different subject areas that the library covers, but what do you think are the library's strengths? 
Well, I think our strength was already mentioned, I think it was mentioned by you before, is our motto. And then we also, uh, Francesca also spoke a little bit about that. One part of the motto is being an instrument of international understanding, right? So what that does is not, doesn't just give you a, a motto, a mission, it actually is also a strength. Because it just, in very clear terms, it actually unifies the team already. And it allows us also, it helps us to make the right choices, for example, for our collections, but also for our services. What can we do to create even more understanding, right? So it's, it's actually quite simple. It brings what we do for that, and I think the League of Nations Library, who was our predecessor, you know, they've already applied that as well. They brought people together for the, let's say, the common cause of the United Nations. And this remains a priority for us. So... When we have these people together also, of course, we can then also disseminate more of the knowledge. It spreads amongst the people that are there, but then not through outreach, through the products that we have. We, uh, we can then disseminate all this to a global public as well. We also try to, or we enable diplomats to learn more about multilateralism itself. That's also like a key and, and important issue, and that again creates more understanding. We bring then the, the diplomats together with the staff, I would bring the conference delegates in, and again, we tie this in through uh, events and other activities on site and online to the rest of the world. You know, we created for this the knowledge and learning commons, and it really gives us uh, a, a space for a knowledge exchange. And what it also does, it helps us to be more innovative in how we create the interaction. So this is a uh, something that we work on, and I think we be, we're becoming stronger. You know, almost every month with that as we go along in that evolution there. The library collection actually predates the UN, and we have books that come from the time of the League of Nations and other collections. If there was one part of the historical collection that you would like to see given more prominence, what would it be and why? I think it's quite obvious one. It's what we call the Peace Collection. So the Peace Collection is actually one that was started by the League of Nations already. They, back then, they purchased books, but they also received donations and pamphlets and, and all kinds of other publications from uh, authors, known and not so known authors, and it's all in the realm of peace. So it's books by philosophers such as Immanuel Kant, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, so I'm, I'm citing, of course, the more known ones. But then there are also lesser known, such as, um, but equally important, so I should say this in the same phrase, actually, lesser known but equally important scripts, and those are often by, mainly European though, statesmen and eminent thinkers. Uh, for example, in the 16th century, of actually one piece that's in the museum right now, in the UN Museum. Uh, it's a peace plan that was proposed to Henry IV by the Duc de Sully. We actually had today a visit of the uh, German Minister for Economic Development. And she was very impressed by this work because she also realized, you know, through a few sentences where we, or my colleague was a uh, was um, presenting this this book she understood the context and I'm coming back to what Francesco said you know the context of this uh, work in the 16th century and uh, the work that has followed from that this was a peace plan that, w that was proposed based on that current context at this time you know the historic context and through this uh, peace collection you can see how the context changed how the thought changed how it evolved and so it's not only each individual piece that's actually interesting, but it's also the, the collection as a whole. And I think that's what, uh, what I would like as a project, actually I have a pet project. I would like to stimulate more research on, on this collection and what is within this collection and create more links, you know, so to enable us all to better grasp you know, the evolution of multilateralism, hopefully to inform also how we could also uh, continue in the future. Mm. So the context has changed also for libraries. Um, libraries have evolved since 1919 when this one was founded. How do you see the role of the library in service to multilateralism in today's world? Well, let me start with the role of the library in general, I guess, because there are many critics today who think that uh, libraries might not be necessary anymore, you know, because anyone has access, digital access, to any type of information nowadays. But actually, only yesterday, I had a discussion with the head of the ECLAC Library. So that's the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And he's also in charge of web services. And of course, they have also asked themselves the same questions. And we usually go through it when we think of our name, libraries, they're still appropriate. 
So we've been going through this for like years, you know. Aren't we more a knowledge center now? Are we are, are we going to research center for research? What what really you know is still speaking to people today? And uh, it, at ECLAC, just like here at UNAC, we all realize that library still has a particular meaning that makes sense and that is still relevant today. A library is still a place. It's a place, maybe virtual, but it's still a place where people go to to get information. And like what Francesco said, it's vetted information. It's a, a particular type of information. And also when you get there, you find people that have information expertise. So uh, this is actually where I want to go to now, this library on multilateralism. So what we are going to even to strengthen even more is to bring out this expertise in the service of multilateralism. So for the diplomats, for the conference delegates and the UN staff and provide what you call nowadays information literacy tools, but also information literacy training and coaching. So this is how we think that um, we could actually help shape our societies, you know, through our clients who are these people that are the, the concrete actors in multilateralism together with us. So more to come. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's turn now to the archives, which uh, perhaps deal with history, but are resolutely contemporary in the way that they do so. And our archives have recently completed a digitization of the archives of the League of Nations. Some 14.2 million documents were digitized and some cases restored and preserved and described and then now made available for free to researchers around the world. Um, Blondine, what has that project meant for research on multilateralism and what changes and what new research have you seen as a result of that project? Well, the, the League Archives represent an outstanding source, uh, a unique source uh, for understand the beginnings of modern uh, multilateralism. Uh, this was recognized by researchers a few decades ago already, um, and we have seen historiography about the League chan changing a lot, highlighting all the innovations the League created in terms of international cooperation rather than focusing on its political failure. Uh, continuities between the League and the UN also have been uh, more and more studied. With the digitization of the entire collection and, and its free uh, online access uh, from all over the world, we see a stunning increase and a diversification uh, of access. So before digitization, around 250 persons uh, would consult the archives per year. We now have an average of 300 per day uh, of individuals uh, accessing the platform and uh, with a total of more than 140,000 users from the launch of the platform in December 2021. We also see a geographical diversification with more and more access from countries which we didn't see before, such as China, India, Turkey, and others. And that's new. We didn't see this before in our community of uh, researchers. Moreover, the digitization has created new paths for research with digital humanities research programs which are using new technologies such as visualization, machine learning, AI, and to mobilize data in an innovative way. And they allow to analyze the past differently. As an example, we have had a partnership with the University of Copenhagen, which uh, developed a tool called Visualizing the League. And uh, this tool uh, helps uncover completely unknown aspects of uh, the League Secretariat. That's really fascinating. But excluding the League of Eight Nations archives, how many linear meters of archives do we have in total? So in addition to League archives, which represent three linear kilometers of shelved archives, we have about 10 kilometers uh, of archives produced by UN secretariat entities in, in Geneva since uh, 1946. Uh, this includes UNOC itself, uh, but also the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the United Nations uh, Conference for, for Trade and Development, and the successive human rights entities. And the idea, of course, would be to be able to digitize the entirety of these archives. This would allow comprehensive access to sources uh, related to the dialogue which was happening between East and West during the Cold War, which is a rather unknown aspect of the history of the UN Commission for Europe, 
This was also to research the decolonization and development uh, with the United Nations Conference uh, for Trade and Development Archives, and last but not least, to the drafting process of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights and the subsequent activities uh, of the human rights entities. So we've heard just um, the tremendous advantages there are of digitization of, of archives. But what are the challenges now for archivists um, in a world in which all our work is produced in the digital arena? And how do you imagine historians of the future will approach this era? So the biggest challenge we are facing today is how to capture and preserve uh, the digitally born records, uh, which are created daily by the different services, and which this would ultimately constitute the in institutional archives. The issue is less a technology, which exists, uh, there are means to, to capture and preserve digitally born uh, records. The, the issue is more the lack of awareness at the decision-making level, as well as at, at the individual level, uh, of the importance of implementing this and using this uh, technology so that the institutional memory can be preserved for the future. Mm. Yes, and I think we will miss some of those little handwritten marks in the margins of papers as well. Yes, and without this, uh, it would be impossible for historians in the future to make research because uh, with technological obsolescence, the data will have been lost or simply unreadable. So what can people working in and around the UN and other multilateral institutions do to facilitate research? So at the global level of the organization, it takes resources to may be made available to implement the necessary tools. And at the individual level, uh, UN staff members should feel responsible to manage the, the records they create in a way which will uh, enable us to preserve them for the future. But of course, it is our duty and responsibility as archivists and records manager to, to s develop awareness and to provide the necessary support to achieve this. Yes. So we're coming to a close, as we are coming to a close also to 2023. And perhaps it's time for a little bit of um, some Santa's lists and the wishes that you would have for the Library and Archives. So if I could grant you a wish each for 2024, what is one innovative new thing you would like to see at the Library and Archives to advance knowledge services for multilateralism? Francesco. My wish would be that one day next year our member states in the General Assembly would intentionally invest money, part of our budget, in knowledge services and preservation of the knowledge of the United Nations so that we could do something in return for them which would be a more immersive environment in which knowledge is directly available through apps, for example, to those delegates that go into official meetings and have today to separate the moment where they acquire access and acquire knowledge, then there is a moment of imagining, I imagine, of percolation of this knowledge, and then there is the official discussion. So we could make that so much better with the intentional investment. And Sigrun, what's your wish? I think it's a continuation of what Francesca was saying, because it's also focusing on technology. And uh, yeah, so I recently participated in the hackathon on UN data. It was really fascinating to see what future developments could look like enabled by artificial intelligence, but not only by artificial intelligence, also by those young people, for example, that are so tech savvy. They have interests that with an angle, you know, that we don't have from within the institution and it really opens up all that. So that's something that I really wish for is that uh, this vast knowledge of the United Nations would be opened up through these kinds of opportunities. And an innovative wish for the archives, Blondine? Only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would like to see, and it's also in the continuity with what uh, Sigon just said, I would like to see more partnerships uh, taking shape, uh, which will allow the Library and Archives to uh, reinforce its position as a center for research on uh, multilateralism. The success of the League Archives digitization uh, has already allowed us to take some important steps and uh, we can foresee that innovative digital humanities projects, especially using AI, uh, will uncover unknown aspects of the evolution of multilateralism and 
the idea would be an AI tool which would help searching across all the library and archives collections. And um, with, uh, with no doubt, this uh, knowledge would help nurture the discussion on the future of multilateralism. Thank you. I look forward to seeing these wishes come true. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot, Amy.